This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. About 40 people stay at this homeless shelter every night. Coming up, we'll tell you about a small organization that has a major impact on fighting homelessness. Coming up, students get a lesson in aquaponics. I'll explain how this is all part of one man's dream to leave behind a legacy. And have you ever wondered what your body looks like from the inside? We're all thinner, I promise. And I'll prove it to you by taking you inside a special exhibit currently at Discovery Place. Don't go anywhere, Carolina Impact starts right now. PBS Charlotte presents Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. When we talk about homeless issues, we often think it's only a problem in our urban areas, but that's not the case. According to the latest statistics, more than half a million people were homeless on any given night across the U.S. Tonight, Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark visits a Union County shelter to learn how a group moves people from homelessness to self-sufficiency. Just a few blocks away from downtown Monroe stands a small brick building. If you drive around back, you'll spot a number of people who call this place home. Wesley Kaziah came to the Union County Community Shelter after his life hit rock bottom. The money that came with being a good worker just, you know, was too much for me to handle at the time. And having an addictive personality and trying new things, I was, I was been addicted to heroin and cocaine for about nine years of my life. His addiction to drugs led to an arrest and eventually Union County Jail. Wesley felt desperate because there was no security net to catch his fall. Some people just don't have the same start as everybody else and they don't have the same connections or the same group that'll lift them up. Like most communities throughout the Charlotte region. Union County is not immune to poverty. As executive director of the Union County Community Shelter, Kathy Bragg can be found giving tours or fundraising, or you may find your thanking community volunteers. Hey guys, thanks for being here today. Everyone will enjoy this so much. In 2015, the Union County Community Shelter provided services to more than 560 individuals, including 67 families. With the temperature in the low 30s on this cold February day. We got a good meal for y'all today, barbecue chicken and all the fixings. Dozens of homeless people crowd into the shelter's dining hall for lunch. Down the hall in the men and women's dorms, there's barely enough space to walk between bunk beds that fill the rooms. The residents here have minimal space to store their belongings. Imagine if everything you own could fit inside a plastic bin. That's exactly what the clients have to do, and they're all stored in this closet. We have 20 men sleeping elbow to elbow in a room that's only about 520 square foot. We're preparing 47,000 meals out of a kitchen that's smaller than your kitchen at home. While anyone in need can get a free meal, the residents who live here must help with the daily chores from sweeping to kitchen cleanup. So people think of a homeless shelter, they think of what we call a hot in a cot, a hot meal and a place for someone to sleep overnight. But here at the community shelter, we know that we have to tackle this problem comprehensively. And in order to do that, Bragg says it involves case managers on staff who work one-on-one -on -one with adult clients, helping them to become self-sufficient. Paris Toffee now works at the shelter, but remembers when she and her children were homeless. One thing's for sure about homeless people, you know, you never can judge a book for its cover. I always dress nice. I would go into my job with a smile. Nobody ever knew my struggle. With a part-time job and two children, Paris couldn't make ends meet. It was just a struggle to think about what were we were going to do next. But they were able to put Paris and her children in a local motel for a short time until she could find more permanent housing. Each of the shelter's clients have to meet with a case manager weekly. We're going to take a snapshot and see what's not working and try to address those pieces quickly to get you back into housing. And then through our post housing, which is 12 months, we'll address the bigger issues. Bigger issues like substance abuse, unemployment, or access to health care. 
I felt like the world was going to end. And, um, you know, just being here is just a, a life changing experience all around. We're always going to have poverty, but we can put some systems in place and some real programming in place that can lift people up and perhaps they can break the cycle of poverty with their children. As for Wesley Kazaya, these days he stays busy repairing broken pipes and plumbing problems. The shelter helped him find a job with a local plumbing company. He now has a home and is married and continues working to repair broken relationships. There are some homeless people that are just just had a bad run with their situation. They, you know, might have had family members die and their depression kicked in and they just couldn't function in a, a normal society. Wesley shares compassion for others dealing with homelessness and he's grateful for the people who helped him get his life back on track. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenbark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. The Union County Community Shelter recently kicked off a $3 million fundraising campaign to build a new facility in Monroe. The 20,000 square foot building would nearly triple the size of the current facility. We're gonna continue our conversation about homelessness now and a special guest joins me. Dennis Marstall is Vice President of Community Investment and Impact for the United Way of Central Carolinas. Dennis, thanks so much for your time, we appreciate it. Well, glad to be here. Now you guys have a pretty big initiative going on that you are trying to end veteran homelessness by the end of this year. Tick tock, tick tock, time's ticking. How you were, how you doing it? Well, actually really well. There's a couple initiatives and make sure it's a community initiative. I mean, so United Way is just one small player. Um, but if you look outside the federal government and even local state government, they're the biggest players in helping solve the homeless puzzle. You bring in United Way resources, the faith community, other individuals who really want to help get at homelessness. But what we've also done is we said, how can we look at the different segments or different populations of homeless? You have the chronic, who are long-term homeless. You have the veteran. You also have family homelessness. You kind of look at some of the youth issues, those who may be in school but are couch surfing or live in motels. So we really are trying to systematically look at how we can look at different segments of the population and really give the federal government a lot of credit. The Veterans Homelessness Initiative, we really actually did it through this past December. And so we're now at a place where we can say functional homelessness, meaning our functional zero, where we have enough beds, support services for the veterans who come in facing homelessness. So there's really an immediate service, an immediate bed to help those veterans who really need the help. But the biggest challenge I think sometimes is you don't know where they are. They don't always self-identify and ask for the help and they end up on the street somewhere not knowing how to turn to get the resources that they need. That's true, but we do have an amazing network of social service, health and human service agencies in our community. One government, but really a lot of the agencies that United Way works with. But really I will say, everyone that you may see who are street homeless, we do know who they are. And this whole effort to end chronic homelessness, we are working from a registry of 400 and some uh, population that we are keeping track of when we first interacted with them, when they're getting the housing service, and how they are being stably housed, and kind of rolling them off the list as being a success story. And so we really do have a good handle and a lot of services to offer those who are street homeless. But then when you do go to those who are living on the edge, those who may be uh, illness, job layoff, or some other family crisis away from homelessness. And there's the working poor issue. We have a lot of folks who can't afford the long-term rent, who are doing friends and family and doubled up. And so those are the ones we really want to try to reach. I mean, that's a larger population who may not be classified as homeless today, but really need the assistance to make sure they don't become homeless. And our whole goal is prevention. If we can keep people from entering the homeless system, that's a shelter, or going to crisis assistance or some other service, how can we keep them from staying, or how do we keep them staying where they're at? your support network. What are some of those things that you are currently doing? A couple initiatives. Um, one is the chronic homeless, we're looking at that, we said the veterans, mm -hmm. but really we have a whole system in place now. So coordinated assessment. We want everyone who's facing a housing or homeless crisis to go to one of three sites in our community. Urban Ministry Center, this is now Charlotte focused, mm -hmm. um, but the coordinated, so it's Urban Ministry Center, Crisis Assistance Ministry, and Salvation Army. But this has been a statewide and federal issue. So there's coordination where if you're homeless in our community or around the region, you go to one of these three stops and you get the assessment of what is the underlying issue of your homelessness. And then what is the best service that can help address your underlying issue? 
It may be a shelter stay for the night or two nights or three nights. It may be rapid rehousing where you do need some rental assistance or maybe just a down payment uh, assistance or utility assistance. So there's some financial, but really the whole issue is case management. How can you get someone to sit down and listen to your story, understand your needs, and then connect you to the right way? It may be mental health services. It may be a health service. It may be a job training. So really looking at the holistic needs of the person or the family and getting them back connected to get them their supports so that they can address their current crisis. Let's talk about, so we've all been in uptown Charlotte mm -hmm. and seen the unfortunate situations of mm -hmm. most folks who are homeless. Mm -hmm. When when can we annihilate that? When do we think there'll be a day that we won't need to see that and they will get these services as you describe? Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, um, but I would say homelessness will always be an issue because those who are homeless today will not be those who are homeless tomorrow. Meaning that those who do have that job loss, those who have that health issue, maybe in five or ten years, they may need these services and may end up being some of those homeless. So the ones that we see on the street today, we know who they are. That's a good thing. We have nine outreach managers across this community who have talked to those folks, who have offered them services, who give them resources, and so those we do know. And so I would say to folks, when you see those, particularly uptown or street corners, whatever it may be, the best way you can help someone is to get them connected to a service and to a support instead of just giving them money. Great information. Dennis Marstall, Vice President of Community Investment for the United Way of Central Carolinas. We appreciate your time and we appreciate all the great work that you do throughout our community. Thank you, I appreciate the time. Next up, what would you do if you found out you had less than six months to live? That's the news Ron Morgan received after he was diagnosed with cancer back in October. While doctors worked to help him, he laid in his hospital bed thinking of a way to help others. Carolina Impact's Daniel Koser shows us he found a solution in sustainable farming. I forgot all about the sweating and the digging. Every time I go out and pick me a digging. Homegrown tomatoes, homegrown tomatoes. Here at South Iredell High School, students share in John Denver's excitement over homegrown tomatoes and lettuce, too. It's very fresh. Senior Megan Parmeter steps out of the classroom and into the greenhouse for a lesson in STEM, short for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Coming in here is exciting because you're like, oh, yes, I don't have to sit at a desk. I can go pick. I can go back. Picking and planting, students also learn about sustainable food production through aquaponics. Aquaponics combines aquaculture, or raising fish, with hydroponics, which is growing plants without soil. So it all starts with the fish tanks. Wastewater from fish tanks provides nutrients for plants. Whiteness of that root indicates its healthiness. The plants remove nutrients from the water, sending clean water right back to the fish. Oh, some beasts, look at those. The result, a zero waste system and free food for the plants. Aquaponics food is very nutritious. It's kind of like unbelievable stepping back and watching it happen. Monty, see these ladybugs? Sam Fleming and Monty Thompson oversee the greenhouses, put into place by the organization 100 Gardens. The nonprofit traces its roots back to 2010. When founder Ron Morgan took a trip to Haiti to help the country rebuild after a devastating 7.0 magnitude earthquake struck just outside the country's capital. When Morgan returned, he put together a plan to help feed the victims of the earthquake, sending hydroponic gardens from the Queen City to Port-au-Prince. Shortly after, he met Fleming. The two teamed up to form 100 Gardens in 2011. The Charlotte-based nonprofit works to educate and empower communities through aquaponics. The organization has greenhouses throughout the Charlotte metro area and two in Haiti. Our plan is to build 100 gardens. We're on number nine right now. In October, Morgan found himself in the wake of another storm. This time, it was personal. Doctors diagnosed him with cancer, offering a grim prognosis. They called him in a week later and said, you got 21 weeks. Morgan had a good cry, then got to work. Let's see if we can't make a difference before we go out. And that's when he came up with this Aqueous One. Blueprints outlined the design for Aqueous One, a state-of-the-art aquaponics learning center with the potential to serve five schools. He's a risk taker, for sure. He's, um, I think, just uh, a great guy. 
Up in the morning and out in the garden, get your right one, don't get a heart. Back at South Arundel High School, sensors in the water allow students to measure critical parameters like pH levels and water temperature. They use cloud computing to share data, taking part in a bigger conversation. Students at other schools are talking with each other about system optimization, science, water conservation. Brandy Starn says she incorporates aquaponics into several of her classes from animal sciences. So where are our pectoral fins on this fish? To horticulture. The greatest thing about this kind of system is it's pretty endless on the things that they can learn. I think that there's a lot of aha moments when they come down here. Oh, so this is how it works. For real, the plants can actually grow off the fish. I also get a test right now. I would ace it, be more in hands on. Students also get a lesson in time management and teamwork, learning how to divide daily tasks. I just enjoy the experience. I mean, it's fun. You get all of us in one place, all over the place, and it's crazy. And it's, it's just fun to be in an environment where it's crazy, but you know what you need to do. It's just fun. Not a lot of students get to do this every day, so I'm privileged. Students harvest about 30 pounds of lettuce every two weeks, and what they can't use, they donate to the local women's shelter. The lettuce gets to serve a purpose and it gets to help out the community. It makes your heart like pitter patter a little bit. Having these kids be involved with something bigger and beyond themselves really, really makes a big difference. Put him back. One harvest at a time, Morgan hopes to leave a legacy through the lives of these students, using the organization to sow seeds of wisdom, giving others the knowledge they need to carry out sustainable food production. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Kosa reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. Sam Fleming, co-founder of 100 Gardens, says his friend Ron Morgan's last scan showed the cancer is almost completely gone. But the side effects from chemo have taken a major toll on his body. Unfortunately, Morgan was too sick to sit down with us for an interview when we were there. You can learn more about the organization by visiting the link on our website at pbscharlotte.org. Here's a little background on me. For several years, I traveled across the country as a national medical reporter. So health issues have always been near and dear to my heart. I've stood beside surgeons as they performed everything from heart bypass surgery to liposuction. I've always been fascinated by how our bodies work. And now an exhibit at Charlotte's Discovery Place gives everyone an insider's look. Producer Russ Hunsinger didn't have to drive far to get to tonight's One Tank trip to learn more about Gunther von Hagen's body worlds and the cycle of life. It's really eye-opening to the human body. Great insight to human anatomy and biology. We are looking at plastinated human bodies and human organ systems. The cycle of life takes us from birth through the aging process all the way to end of life issues. Surprised by all the detail and the muscle structure and the bones and um, just how they were able to contort the bodies to, to show the, the different scenes. Most people are never going to see something like this. The plastination process, which is the replacement of all bodily fluids down to a cellular level with a plastinate, a polymer. So the bodies remain the same weight, but they're able to be posed in such a way that we can see certain organ systems that we wouldn't ordinarily see. We come to our first room, and that is the uh, fetal specimens and the embryonic specimens. Then we move into the skeletal system. We move on then to starting to talk about the human brain and the nerve system itself. We go then into the circulatory system. The embryos for fetus fascinated me, the different stages and how the body develops over the weeks. Seeing hair developing and nails, we often don't get to see that stage. So I thought that was very unique and powerful. Probably the most impactful was the uh, smoker's lungs and all the different smoker's exhibits. I actually work with patients with Alzheimer's dementia, so seeing the beginning process and actually seeing uh, a brain that has Alzheimer's, it gives me a great point of view about the disease. This exhibit was created because Von Hagens wanted to continue education. He thinks that people should have the right to know what their bodies can do, what they look like inside. 
we enjoy bringing our children here because it's important for a lot of the, the children to know exactly parts of the body and this begins the start of their journey. Um, they have a lot of questions to ask. You know, it's like a blank check. They can see the organs. There are photographs um, on display moving photographs of some of the folks who have donated their organs and their bodies to this exhibition. We don't identify them by name, but the families felt it was important that we see who they are. That immediately tells you these are people you can relate to. These were people like you and me. Hopes, dreams, families, full lives. And they wanted to continue the education of the public. I think what's important about this exhibition is allowing people of all ages to come in and take a look at this and really understand, for the first time, uh, to look inside themselves. It's something that I think everybody needs to come see because uh, it can change your life and help you see it health in a new perspective. We are getting some amazing feedback. The kids are fascinated with this. At first, we were concerned that they would be frightened or grossed out, but the smaller children are fascinated. They get what's going on. They may not be able to identify individual organs or the, the systems of the body, but they certainly understand what's happening and they love looking at it. They're full of questions. I'm hoping that he learns a lot from seeing up underneath the skin that it really is a part of our body and we need to embrace it. Take care of it, you know, remain healthy. Thanks so much, Russ. The Body Worlds exhibition is here until May 1st. You can find ticket details on our website. Well, we all have a favorite restaurant, right? And for decades, Anderson's on Elizabeth Avenue was the place to be in Charlotte. For 60 years, the family-run restaurant was a favorite among well-known city leaders and politicians before it closed in 2006. While the restaurant isn't open anymore, Anderson's is still very much in business. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis brings us its story. Charlotte's new CityLink's Gold Line is a throwback to the streetcars of yesteryear. Some might say it's only fitting it passes right by a former Queen City landmark. What's now Viva Chicken on Elizabeth Avenue was for 60 years Anderson's restaurant. Jimmy Anderson and his brothers opened the sandwich shop in 1946. Wanting a signature dessert, Jimmy began selling his pecan pie and labeled it the world's best. He knew that um, he wanted people to remember the restaurant and he needed to find something that they could identify with the restaurant. And that's kind of where the world's best pecan pie came from. Gary Anderson started working at his dad's restaurant as a kid, bussing tables and talking with customers. He grew up with the place. He says it was the ultimate family restaurant. I think that was the key. It was just a comfortable place like being home. We had customers that would get up and get their own coffee. They would come in the kitchen and get food if they needed it. They would pour coffee for other customers when we were busy. I think people just felt comfortable in here. With its close proximity to Presbyterian Hospital and uptown, Anderson's became a who's who of regulars, from local business leaders to local politicians. Doing the cooking in those days was Anthony Jones. He's been with Anderson's for 36 years. Starting as a busboy, he worked his way into the kitchen and has been cooking ever since. I learned from a lot of different cooks here and I used to watch everybody do things and then I, you know, I watched them do something that looked so great. And I just come by and be nosy and you know, I say, well, this looks good. And and I tried it, they come out pretty good a couple of times. They were a little bit off, but I worked it out. After finishing college, Gary went to work with his father, learning all the ins and outs of the business. Jimmy had worked seven days a week most of his life, but in 1983, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and died in 1988. A few years later, Gary's grandfather was also on his deathbed. He left his grandson with some lasting words. One thing that he said to me was, uh, in his very heavy Greek accent, and uh, he said, you know, he said, your dad used to talk about traveling and doing all these things and he never got to do it. He goes, don't make that same mistake. He goes, life's too short. And he said, you know, one day you're gonna get married, you're gonna have a family. He says, don't cheat your family. The catering side of Anderson's began in the early 90s and it started by accident. A friend who worked as a drug rep was supposed to bring food to a meeting at the hospital. He forgot and quickly called Gary. Call me up and he goes, hey man, that was great. Can you do another one for me? And that's kind of how we got into the catering business by accident. It wasn't until Gary got married and started a family that his grandfather's words came back to him. He first started closing the restaurant on Sundays, then Saturday nights. And after thinking it over for three years, the final decision to close Anderson's restaurant permanently in 2006 after 60 years in business. The hardest part of the decision was we did have a great customer base and I loved 
the interaction that I had with, with people that came in here, and they were family. Closing the restaurant allowed more time with family. It also allowed Gary to focus on the catering side of the business. Working out of the back part of the old restaurant, Chef Anthony still serves up everything on the original Anderson's menu. Fried chicken, barbecue chicken, mac and cheese, broccoli casserole, the list goes on. And what would Anderson's be without pies? Banana pudding, coconut cream, and of course, the world's best pecan pie. What makes the pies the world's best? I can't tell you that. <laughs> Trade secret, right? The pecan recipe hasn't changed since 1959. 10-inch, extra deep, made with pecan halves, not pieces, all made from scratch. And the only guy who makes them? Chef Anthony. Pretty much now they are at perfection, and I'm proud to make them, I tell you, really. While Anderson's has evolved over the last decade, one thing has not changed since it first opened 70 years ago. The nice thing is that we really try to give good service, and we haven't changed how we do things. We still make everything from scratch. And, uh, you know, it's about service and quality, and, and we continue to try to do that. At 59, Gary hasn't slowed down a bit, and he has no desire to either. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Thanks, Jason. Anderson's has specially made boxes for mail delivery. They've shipped their pies as far away as Alaska. By the way, Jason shared a couple of those pies with our staff. I didn't even get a slice. But I did kind of scrape the bottom out and had a little piece of the pecan, and it was pretty amazing. Everyone who had a slice said it was delicious. Well, you can find more about Anderson's on our website at pbscharlotte.org. Before we go, time is rapidly running out for talented teens and teachers to enter our third annual STEM Awards for 6th through 12th graders. Now, the deadline to enter is less than two weeks away, March 14th. You'll find all the details on our homepage at pbscharlotte.org. We also want to remind you to friend us on Facebook for a chance to win monthly prizes. I've always said there's no such thing as strangers. You're all just friends I haven't met before. So please, let's meet virtually, at least by friending us on Facebook. Well, that does it for all of us this week. We appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope to see you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.